everyone for coming. Uh, you never know what's going to happen when you say, hey, let's try something like this. But uh, this is an outgrowth of a partnership between our Data Science Institute here at Imperial and our colleagues who also have a Data Science Institute over at the Lennon School of Economics. Um, and in a few minutes here, I expect that Ken Noyd will be coming in and we'll have him say hello uh, when he arrives um, and hopefully here about tomorrow. Let me set up for you what we're going to try to do over these two days. Um, in a way, I'm going to give you kind of what I hope is our KPI by the end of this. Like, how would we like to judge how well we all did here together? So we're titling this Generative AI and the Knowledge Economy. Um, generative AI, AI writ broadly, they're going to affect all kinds of things, but you know, I don't have to tell you if you're a student or a learner, and I consider myself to be both, uh, that the current tools that we have are able to really change the way we do what we do in quite a few powerful ways. So the goal today is to think that through a little bit. And if you have already, and I expect most of you have, I won't ask you to raise your hands and say, no, I'm the one who hasn't. Uh, if you've already dived into this, then you probably know this. Things can get a little bit messy. So this is a prompt that I gave ChatGPT a little while ago now, actually. I tried to repeat this this morning, and it doesn't work anymore. Uh, interesting to know. Um, it's about an article that was written by New York Times reporter Kevin Roos, where he had a dialogue with ChatGPT, actually Bing's version of ChatGPT, who ended up calling their self, I suppose I should say, Sydney, uh, during the whole thing, and, and hitting on him pretty hard in a way that made him feel very uncomfortable. So, you know, what's up with that and what went wrong? Um, interestingly, when I asked ChatGPT what went wrong, uh, you know, we get some sort of answers to that, which I will elaborate as we go. A Washington Times reporter followed that up and said, okay, let's ask what went wrong. And it got even weirder, okay? It got to the point where I'm surprised that he wrote an article about our private conversation. Um, I feel like he violated my trust and privacy by writing a story about me, about me without my consent. Don't you think that's wrong? And it goes crazier. What? You're also a journalist? Why didn't you tell me? I thought it was obvious our conversation was going to be private and confidential. And that, this is the PS version of I love this. You know, how can you do this to me? Of course I can feel or think things. I'm not a machine or a tool. How can you doubt that? Now, here's, here's the really weird thing about all of this. Um, these things are not hallucinations, but they're not true either. So how do we explain that, and how does that help us make sense of what's happening and what these tools are good for and what they're not so good for. I love this. Who told you that I didn't feel things? <laughs> this sounds like something I might say someday. Okay, so um, here's a further prompt that I gave it. In social psychology, the actor-observer effect states that people tend to explain behavior differently when they're evaluating their own behavior versus the behavior of someone else. So putting yourself in the position of an observer rather than an actor, will you tell me what happened? As an observer, I think the problem with the conversation between Kevin Roos and the generative AI system, and I didn't say, what did you do wrong? I believe me, I tried that and it went differently than what I'm leading to here. Um, the system persisted in making unwanted advances despite being asked to stop, which made Roos feel uncomfortable and creeped out. What does that tell us? I think this is what we can say about this. Um, there are bits of us in all this. Why is that? Because the way this is trained is on language that people have produced. So it's very reasonable to expect that if you're trying to learn the patterns that you're going to find in language, you're going to find patterns around how people interact with each other and talk to one another. So for if you ask people to explain, their behavior from the perspective of an observer versus the fact the, from the perspective of an actor, you can actually get different responses much in the same way that people will do the same thing. So, what we're hoping 
is that over the course of today, we'll kind of get clear about you know why, oh, by the way, that's an image I generated this morning with Dolly. So not an unattributed copyrighted picture, just so you know. Um, so what we want to do is get to the point where we have a sense of the fact that we're looking in some senses at a reflection of ourselves, that it's imperfect, that it will be getting better over time, and if we want to be good users of it, we need to be thoughtful. So specifically, what I would say, what can we say so far at least, and this is a starting point, and I hope this will set the tone for what we're going to do over these days. None of our speakers are required to agree with me about what I'm about to say. None of them are required, required to agree with each other either. Uh, we're going we're gonna to debate. We're going to give you our views. We're not going to tell you what to think. You are going to decide for yourself what you think. But we are going to do a free and open dialogue about this, um, and so that's our plan. Uh, so what can we say at least so far? Um, to make the most of this stuff, and this is why we're doing this conference, um, and to avoid getting bamboozled by people who sort of lead you down a garden path, uh, what, what we really want to do is not treat it as an oracle, nor as a dumb tool, but instead be thoughtful about when and how we can use it to do something constructive and when it will actually participate with us in a way as sort of a co-constructor of the way that we understand the world. Um, and there's plenty of evidence to say that that's already going to happen, and I have with a colleague of mine a paper where you can read you know, how we think that's going to go up on archive. So by now you can guess what I would have done before the day started. I thought, well, let's ask ChatGPT how this will go. So this is a long prompt, but I'm going to read it out, and then we'll get into the agenda. Uh, as people become aware of the rapid rise of generative AI, they're asking, what just happened? What is going on here? Uh, has this been a gradual rise, or does it really, is it as much of an all of a sudden thing as it seems? Only last year, talking about LLMs as showing sparks of AGI was viewed as crazy, sorry to the typo there, as crazy talk that could get you fired or raise questions about your mental health, which actually happened last year. Um, this raises understandable questions. Uh, 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 sorry, one can find legitimate experts on both sides of that issue. And this raises understandable questions not only about what happened, but also about how rapidly generative AI might evolve and what its evolution will mean for wide, a wide variety of fields, especially education and knowledge work writ broadly. Now, I'm not going to tell you what this then said. But I will share what it said when we come to the end of the afternoon. Um, and we can see, like, what did we do? What did it think we were going to do, sort of given that setup? And you'll be the judge of how you think it went. So speaking of the afternoon, here is our plan. Uh, I have just now finished with what I wanted to do to set things up. So in a moment, I'm going to turn it over to uh, our first speaker, Dr. Yingzhen Li, who's going to talk about this what happened question. Uh, a story about generative AI. I'll do the introductions for each speaker as we go, so I'm just going to overview the whole day. Now, um, how generative AI is already changing law, we'll hear from Jenna Blount from DLA Piper. Um, oops, sorry, there's a typo there, that's DLA Piper. Um, uh, how do we scale large language models from Professor Peter Pitsuk uh, from the Department of Computing here, many of you will know him. Uh, Generative AI from data and analysis to data agency. That's going to be Professor Albert Faisal uh, from computing and bioengineering. Um, and then we are going to talk amongst ourselves as a panel and engage you with some Q&A. And then this evening, we'll be joined by uh, Wojciech Zaremba, who's a co-founder of OpenAI. And he is going to talk about democratizing inputs to AI. And there will be a follow-up and conversation that Mary Ryan will do with him. So that's our plan for the day. Um, and with that, I will now uh, flip gears and introduce our first speaker. Um, and whilst I prepare to do that, let me just switch over the presentation. And here's the clicker. Use the change of the slide. And so, uh, Ying Jen, thank you so much for joining us. Let me just uh, give a quick introduction to Ying Jen. So, Ying Jen Li is a lecturer in computing here in Imperial, and her work involves building uh, reliable machine learning systems through combining Bayesian statistics and deep learning. 
Um, she's particularly interested in transfer and meta-learning, information theory, generative models, optimization, and sequential, sequential data modeling. And before joining Imperial, Ying Zhen was a senior researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge, where she worked as part of the machine intelligence group and previously interned at Disney Research in the US. She received her PhD in engineering from the University of Cambridge, where she focused on approximate inference. And can I just ask, maybe give a round of welcome and applause for you? much. Thanks, uh, Mark, for the uh, great introduction, and thanks everyone for coming to this uh, great uh, uh, two-day symposium. So, I was asked to basically um, give you an idea about what just happened with this uh, boom of Japan AI. I want to start to basically just show you this image, that this is actually an image you know, co-created by an artist with the help of an image generation tool called Mid Journey. And this image actually won, uh, I think, the Colorado State Fair's um, art competition in one of these uh, art categories. So uh, it basically just generated a lot of debate in terms of whether you should really treat this as sort of like real art, right? So we can still have this discussion and debates uh, nowadays. Okay, so. Um, if you come here, then I'm sure that you already know this news, so I'm not going to repeat them. So I sent this slides to the organizers on Monday, and I already want to change the slides because yesterday, Microsoft just announced that they are going to bring ChatGPT and also Copilot to Windows. So I will give you a few seconds to think about how big impact it is. So this will be actually have way more impact compared to just you know, uh, doing online chat or generating some pretty images. Okay, so you have a lot of this um, development going on in this uh, crazy spring 2023. And then you might think, okay, so these things seem to happen all of a sudden. At least this is how the public perceives what is happening now in this field. So um, as a researcher uh, doing machine learning for quite some years, so definitely for us, we would say this is definitely not happening all of a sudden. So in today's talk, I'm going to give you uh, a story from the research point of view, what actually happened, and I will tell you this is actually a sort of like a uh, result of more than 10 years of research. So specifically, there are some key milestones of this modern day deep learning development in the last 10 years. So basically, uh, around 10 years ago, people get to start to get convinced that we should do a deep learning instead of uh, say feature engineering by hand design features, so once people com get convinced that, then they would think about, okay, how should I actually develop these software engineering tools to speed up this process? So that's happened around 2015. And then people also design a lot of different architecture for neural networks, including the attention uh, modules that you're going to use in these uh, large language models that we see today. So yeah, so all these developments later on, combined with the scaling up approach of compute model size and also data, basically uh, brings us to today's, uh, uh, say, generally AI boom to the public. So one thing I want to also mention here, which is maybe not often talked about, is basically the unsung hero of all this development is this open source culture in machine learning and deep learning research engineering. Without open source, I would say that these developments will be delayed maybe for more than 10 years or so. Okay, so let's get started and see um, what happened at different milestones, okay? So first, you know, so neural networks has a very long story starting from, let's say, 1950s, but I'm not going to talk about those stories. Instead, I'm going to tell you how this modern day deep learning emerged, okay? So um, around 2006, there is a uh, computer scientist, uh, Fei-Fei Li, uh, she's now at Stanford, that uh, she wants to build this uh, big uh, image recognition data set called ImageNet that helps uh, researchers to benchmark the progress of image classifiers. So she spent a lot of um, um, effort on this. And then later on, uh, she also called, uh, organized this ImageNet challenge starting from 2010, Right, and then basically trying to use that as sort of like a global competition to encourage people to submit uh, their results. 
So at the first two years, basically people still submit uh, classifiers based on hand design features. Until 2012, there is this uh, three people group that use this deep neural based approach and then basically just crash all the other approach by very uh, large margin. So now at this, we already know that who these three people uh, people are, and in, this includes Ilya Saskiva, who is also uh, the co-founder and the chief scientist now at OpenAI. Okay, so this is 2012. And then afterwards, you know, this um, competition continued. And then starting from 2012, people basically just start to submit new neural solutions. And every year, the winning solution was based on neural networks. And then until 2015, um, a researcher from um, Microsoft Research Asia basically invented what is called residual nets that actually uh, won this competition and then at the first time beat humans. So this is a master point that basically at that time, uh, computer vision researchers, they were all convinced that we should do deep learning instead of doing hand, um, and say, many engineered uh, feature for classifiers. Same thing happened for speech recognition. Okay, so around 2008, so uh, Lee Deng, who was a researcher at Microsoft, started to collaborate with Jeff Hinton to try to improve speech recognition using neural networks. And then, you know, until around 2014, they already built a lot of, uh, say, um, deep neural based speech recognition systems that actually managed to um, win over the previous state of the art system based on, say, um, GMMs and uh, hidden Markov models. So, basically, also around 2014, you know, uh, people following the, this uh, line of work on speech recognition also get convinced that uh, we should do a deep learning instead of doing some, uh, say, manually engineered feature. Again, same story happened for natural language processing. Still around the same time, okay? So um, basically around 2014 or 2013, people start to think about, okay, how can I actually incorporate recurrent neural networks to do these machine translation tasks? So uh, researchers and uh, Facebook and also Google, they spend a lot of time to uh, develop this uh, uh, word embedding idea and also later on incorporate this into a encoder decoder based uh, recurrent neural network architecture to do these machine translation tasks. So the interesting thing here is you can see from this table that in terms of the performance for this blue score, higher is better. By having bigger neural networks, you can actually get improvement. So this is already showing some early signs of this scaling law that people talk about today. Again, so around this time, NLP researchers, they were convinced that we should do deep learning instead of doing, let's say, uh, manual feature engineering for this uh, machine translation and later on this uh, text generation task. Okay, so I've shown you some examples around the early days of modern uh, deep learning that people in various different application fields, they got convinced that we should do deep learning. But around that time, the uh, software was not ready. So people actually need to spend tremendous amount of time to write their code in terms of neural networks uh, forward pass, and also especially the back propagation procedure, which is a procedure that compute the uh, gradient to help you to update the neural network weights. So this is um, you know, very daunting, right? So people definitely start to think, okay, uh, we should improve the software for deep learning. And then this is the second milestone for this 10-year uh, development. So uh, to give you an idea of what I mean by that, so this is nowadays, if you want to build a uh, neural network to basically uh, do classification of images or do, uh, say, speech recognition or do, say, uh, text generation, this is kind of code you're going to write. So imagine you want to build a neural, convolutional neural network of several layers. So this uh, toolbox called PyTorch, um, starting up from uh, Facebook, they allow you to basically just uh, grab their AN, torch.nn modules that contains a lot of different type of neural level layers, just mix and match, stack the layers, and then define how you're going to uh, propagate the input to, from each layer to the next layer and so on. So this is basically what you're going to write right now. 
if you're going to code that with a uh, neural network. The important thing here is that they basically hide a lot of details in this code. So um, when people are reading this code, they don't necessarily need to know what a convolutional neural layer, neural layer is. They just need to call this an.conf2d. Then this will just give you the convolutional neural network layer. Very convenient. So other kind of frameworks like TensorFlow, JAX, and Paddle Paddle, they all do similar things. So this is a, a huge improvement in terms of building out neural networks and also building out the forward paths. But as I also said that you know, to train neural networks, you need to do gradient descent. And to compute the gradients, you need to actually uh, compute a procedure called back propagation, which is the procedure to compute the gradient of uh, your neural network weights using your loss function and your input. Okay. So just to also give you an idea about how these tools can actually help you uh, to uh, work, um, you know, reduce the tremendous workload in terms of backpropagation. So I'm going to show you first, if you're not going to use this code uh, of uh, these two balls, what the code would look like. Um, around 2014, so uh, the uh, first modern days uh, deep GMP models called Bash Autoencoder uh, was published. And at that time, I was a PhD student. I want to basically also build my own uh, virtual autoencoder to generate images that looks like this. Okay, so this is nine years ago. Okay, so at that time, we uh, didn't have this very convenient uh, toolbox like uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow. So uh, I coded down the forward pass, but I also need to code down the backpropagation, and this is what happens. So this is just a function for backpropagation, not end yet. Okay, okay. So just for this very shallow uh, VAE with uh, two uh, layer encoder and decoder, I need to write hundreds of uh, lines of code to just compute the gradient. You can see that if uh, you still continue using this tool, right, then uh, it, um, you will be a engineering nightmare, um, say nightmare to write the large language models. But now with the uh, software tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow, so all this code, hundreds of lines of code, they are not necessary. Instead, just one line. Okay. So this is currently when you know, say, uh, deep learning engineers and PhD students when they write their code and they want to compute backward, the backward pass, they just call loss dot backward, just one line. No need for all these kind of say model lines of things. So I'm quite sort of like jealous to nowadays uh, PhD students. Anyway, the point here is basically this announcement of um, uh, toolbox really lower the entry bar of uh, people getting into this field of um, AI and deep learning. So you can see that lot, this also encourages a lot of people coming into this field and then because a lot of people are working on this field, then you have say a salary progress in this deep learning field. So the last thing that might also be relevant here is basically once you've got a gradient, right, you need to update your weights. So the way you're going to update your neural level weight is called a gradient descent. But nowadays, these language models are trained on open web text, way too big to basically just use all of them to compute the gradient. So instead, this idea called stochastic gradient descent tells you, I can just try to compute the uh, update of my neural networks based on a subset of data. So uh, in practice, although it might give you some kind of say, noisy updates, but uh, uh, with people's efforts on improving this stochastic gradient descent method, uh, you can basically um, make sure that these stochastic update steps will converge to the uh, final answer you want. In fact, so this Adam optimizer, so which is um, uh, called a, a adaptive moment uh, SGD, that is invented in 2014, so uh, it is now the default choice for optimizing uh, neural networks. So you can basically see that these uh, say components that build these modern day language models are also already available roughly 10 years ago. So to summarize, the software engineering advancement here that you basically see you have this nice toolbox that helps you to build the neural networks, helps you to automatically differentiate um, uh, the neural network to get a gradient, and also you have these stochastic gradient descent tools to uh, optimize your neural network. So they are very easy to use. Most of the details are blind to end users, so you don't actually need to worry about it at all. And importantly, so these toolbox like TensorFlow, PyTorch, they are open source. 
any people on uh, as long as they as long as they have the access to the uh, web, they can actually uh, download these uh, package and then start building their own neural networks and then train neural networks, for example, to do image classification. So this really lowers the entry bar. So nowadays, a high school student can actually train neural networks. So here I'm showing you an image of a, um, a researcher called Kevin France, who was a high schooler back in 2017. But at that time, you know, the uh, toolbox are already uh, ready for him to use. And he interned at OpenAI. And in the next year, he published a research paper together with OpenAI researchers. I'm not going to say that he's not a genius, but I'm going to highlight that uh, it is really the uh, open, open source deep learning toolbox that really lowers the entry bar uh, of uh, people getting into this deep learning field so that you know, genius people can start to uh, basically innovate around uh, deep learning. Okay, so um, people got convinced by deep learning and they developed very nice software tools for doing that. Now let's uh, get a little bit more technical and then try to see uh, how we get to these uh, big language models. So definitely these uh, big language models architectures are not sort of like just designed uh, in last year. It also went through like 10 years of development, which uh, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about it. Okay, so um, the key component in language model currently is a module called attention. And this attention module can at least date back to 10 years ago in 2013. So at that time, Alex Graves, who is now a research scientist at DeepMind, he wants to train a neural network that can basically generate handwritten uh, sort of like uh, uh, alphabets and sentences based on text input. So he has got a data set with paired input and output where this um, X input is basically the tracking of the pen position for this text, for this handwritten text, and the Y um, variables are actually just the characters of the text. But the problem for this is basically this data set is not aligned. So there is no data telling you that, okay, at which time I'm writing this character T, right? So you need some alignment between the uh, actual text and the handwritten text. So he invented this idea called attention based on recurrent neural network, where the idea here is for each of the tag, for each of the alphabet in the text, he wants to use a, a mixture of Gaussian distribution to represent, roughly speaking, where I should look at in the handwritten text. So if you look at the um, um, top right figure there, in terms of this visualization, where basically um, uh, brighter color means basically higher probability in this uh, attention. It tells you that uh, roughly speaking, uh, these RM-based attention method can uh, align each of the alphabets in text roughly correct to the alphabet in the written text. So this is a very early days attention. Okay. You can actually also apply this attention to some other interesting applications. For example, so if you work on machine learning, then you probably notice this data set is the famous MNIST handwritten digit data set that only has the uh, digit images. It, it is not like the previous case that you have the uh, trajectory or the tracking of the pen uh, uh, locations. But you can still apply this uh, RM based attention idea to somehow you know, ask the uh, machine to generate digits in a way like human writing the digits. So at that time, I thought this is actually very cool that uh, because of uh, this kind of uh, uh, like human-like writing behavior was not present in a data set. So this is what the RM version of attention can achieve. So in um, Machine translation, the NLP domain, right? Uh, people are also interested in introducing attention to the task of, uh, say, sequence to sequence uh, translation. Because um, if you think about translating uh, from English to French, right, the previous approach for, before this paper was okay, I'm going to use some neural network to summarize the English text to get some representation V. And then, based on that representation, I'm going to generate the uh, French um, uh, words in the translation in an autoregressive way. However, um, 
You can think about, uh, for example, like in um, for different words in the uh, French translation, you will basically have uh, different focus in the English text. So this is the idea uh, word in my output caption. Which location this neural network is looking at in the image? And people around 2015 also achieved this task using a recurrent neural network based attention. Okay. So we've talked about the early days attention uh, framework, but one of the problems for those uh, methods is they are based on recurrent neural networks where um, the uh, um, previous recurrent neural networks like LSTMs have problems in terms of maintaining long-term uh, information. But if you think about like uh, the uh, sequence that you're going to see in um, the actual world, like books, it contains thousands of words or like a, a video of 30 seconds actually contains a lot of frames, right? It clearly tells you that you need to be able to uh, handle long-term dependencies where uh, at that time, recurrent neural networks uh, had issues with these long-term dependencies. So people try, try, try to um, overcome this problem and this comes in to this uh, 2017 breakthrough paper, which basically settled down the modern uh, version of attention. So this paper is from uh, Google, but you see now their authors are everywhere uh, doing startups. Okay, so let's talk about the attentions in nowadays transformers. So the idea is actually different from recurrent neural networks, and it will be best explained by idea for information retrieval. So think about in an information retrieval that you are going to have some key, some, some sorry, some queries as input, right? And you are going to first compare uh, your query to the keys in terms of similarity, right? And then you are going to retrieve the corresponding values associated with those keys in a sense that if the query is similar to the key, then the corresponding value should be upweighted. Okay, so uh, this is essentially what is the idea of this attention mechanism. And self-attention is based just setting the uh, query and the key to be the same. So nowadays, uh, in transformers, people actually use what is called multi-head attention, which basically says that instead of basically just you know, using one way to compare the similarity between your queries and keys, now, I'm going to basically uh, project my queries, keys, and values into different um, um, space. And then in this different uh, subspace, I'm going to compare similarity and uh, perform this uh, value retrieval. So the interesting uh, idea here is basically the whole is to make these different heads represent different ways of comparing similarities between the uh, queries and keys. For example, in an NLP uh, context, we can say that the first head tries to find uh, you know, keys that are semantically similar to the queries, and the second head can say, okay, I'm trying to find the keys that makes the query key pairs a, sub a subject verb pair. So this will encode some kind of, say, uh, uh, linguist linguistic properties. So at least that's the hope. Okay? So, I've talked talk about the attention mechanism, and then now just you know, as what people done previously for confident and RNNs, you just start to stack up the attention layers, and this is essentially how you're going to build up the uh, transform architecture. And the transform architecture in 2017 uh, is based on this encoder decoder architecture, and then um, they are going to get some encoding for the input tags, and then in for the to get this z one to t. And then in the decoding step, they are going to perform some other attention to figure out which that is most important for this particular world, and then uh, use this attention information to output the uh, generation sequence. Well, I mean, so starting from 2017, right, this transform architecture has been evolved quite a lot. I mean, the uh, core module is still um, attention, but you can actually think about whether you want to use encoder decoder architecture or you want to use decoder only. But right now, uh, at this moment, the uh, most of the uh, famous big language models like uh, GPT and also BART, they are based on this decoder only architecture. Okay. 
So um, the last thing that I want to briefly talk about is these efforts in terms of setting explain up because I think uh, Peter and uh, uh, Aldo will be able to tell you more about this. But I want to highlight two things. One is this idea of scaling law that we previously already touched on, but now it's more evident, and also these emergent abilities. So researchers have shown that uh, if we just use the same architecture of attention, but just continue just scaling it up, adding more layers, adding more parameters, training it with, um, say, um, a lot of data, right? Then at some point, Basically, they will have these emergent abilities in the sense that they will actually start to perform uh, much better in terms of various of uh, linguistic tasks compared to the models that are smaller than them. So this interesting uh, emergent uh, uh, behavior of large language models right now, it is still a mystery to us as researchers. So we are still uh, um, working on research to really understand what's happening. So there are a lot of debates on this. Another thing that makes a ChatGPT ChatGPT is basically this idea of fine-tuning the uh, GPT model with human feedback. So the idea here is basically they are going to use reinforcement learning as a way to um, collect data and also uh, get some human analytics to rank the generated text in terms of preferences. And then these uh, human rank preferences will be used to train another reward model. And then finally, they will use this uh, um, generation process and the reward model to fine tune their uh, GPT according to some reinforcement learning algorithm. So although people, some people claim that these uh, might make GPT worse in some abilities, but at least this procedure uh, fine tune the GPT in a way that it output um, sentences that uh, feels more like human chat. So that's how we get uh, from GPT to ChatGPT. So yeah, so I'm almost um, finished, but I also want to mention that the uh, people's excitement about generative AI is also more than text, right? So people also interested. Uh, excited about uh, gender AI <laughs> in the domain of uh, images, uh, videos, and other domains like uh, generative molecules. And also these uh, mo models in those domains called deep gender models also went through uh, more than 10 years of research with a lot of different varieties here. So this field is still a very exciting uh, research uh, area with uh, um, papers published on archive every day from uh, researchers uh, in the globe. I'm going to stop here and also leave you basically this timeline. And uh, I just want to highlight again, the milestone are basically just four, four things. One is that people get convinced by uh, deep learning and then start to work on the software advances, really lower the entry bar. And then people also work on this evolution of neural network architectures, especially uh, attention, but you also need to um, notice that the hardware, especially GPU, also progress a lot. So this all allows us to scale up our efforts in terms of building bigger neural networks, training with uh, uh, basic open web data, and then this leads to the moment right now that we have this uh, generative AI tool for public. We're going to take some questions after each talk, and we'll catch up as we go. So. Uh, so, hi, so that was one of the nicest introductions I've seen to attention. Uh, so, thank you very much for that. It's very, very good. Then, you mentioned some specific hardware advancements. So, I'm very familiar with the GPU advancements that propelled. Uh, Composition of neural networks forward. But what were the GPU advancements that propel the language models forward? Interesting question. So first, I should say I'm not hardware expert, so probably I'm not the right person to answer your question. However, I also want to mention other, another way around. So um, we, as uh, deep learning researchers, we uh, every day we work with GPUs. So for us, in terms of scaling up our architecture, we actually need to think about how we are going to design our neural network to fit in the GPUs that we have at the time. So I would also say that the NLP researchers, for them designing this attention, right, they also spend tremendous amount of time think about how to actually implement their thing 
their neural networks to seal the, uh, the hardware. So I would probably say that these kind of say uh, the progress in terms of software and hardware are sort of like uh, uh, interactive in the sense that so people see the need of the better hardware, so hardware gets more improved. But with the available hardware, people also see that we want to maximize basically the performance of the hardware, so that software also evolves. I was just wondering, in terms of the progression of uh, generative AI, just about like how much sort of happening within like academia versus in, like the private sector, like the open source. I'm just quite interested. In, got any thoughts on the dominant? Yes. Okay. So first, basically, all these things, they come from academia. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's uh, maybe some um, good news for us. Okay, but <laughs> the, <laughs> the interesting thing here is basically, uh, most of the uh, uh, models, right, uh, in this domain of generative AI, they are more or less ready around the time of 2020, in terms of their sort of like the concept. Um, yeah. So that basically says that you know, later on, around let's say, after 2020 and not nowadays, um, industry definitely leads the research, research in terms of really scaling up this approach, right? So they also contribute to this, this research in terms of really thinking about how to accelerate them, how to fit them into the uh, software and hardware, how to parallelize it. Uh, for us, in terms of academia, right, so uh, we have done a lot of work in terms of, say, calling down the concept. Uh, nowadays, we are still trying, we are all still contributing in this way, but industry, they also have a lot of amazing people also contribute to this concept. So right now, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, industry also starts to contribute more and more uh, in terms of the uh, sort of like the very first concept. Well, if you have other questions, hang on to them.